So on to our session. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Kasia Broska. Kasia is Senior Digital Marketing Manager at Cambridge University Press. She holds a BA in English Philology and an MA in British and North American Studies and taught English in Poland, Spain and Ireland before embarking on a digital career in the travel and retail industries. She now uses her digital expertise in online content, social media and digital customer experience to help ELT strategy and marketing departments at Cambridge University Press to reach, engage and inspire millions of teachers and learners worldwide. So without further ado, over to you, Kasia. Thank you, Charlotte. Hello, everyone. Let me just uh, do a quick share of my screen first. If you can let me know when you start seeing my screen. Is it visible, Charlotte? Yes, all visible, Kasia, go ahead. Perfect, thank you so much. Right, okay. So first of all, a warm welcome to everyone joining us for this session today from around the world. I've had a quick look at the chat and we have people from everywhere, um, Ecuador, Peru, Vietnam, Spain, Italy. Um, it's great to have so many of you here. So in this talk, I'd like to share some insights and examples of digital learning in action. And that will be within the context of primary and secondary education. So I'll try to make it as practical as possible for you. So we'll be looking at plenty of examples, demos and tips that you'll hopefully be able to use with your students. So to set the scene a little bit, I want to reflect on how much digital input children receive from a very young age. A report published by Childwise earlier this year um, indicated that about 53% of UK children own a mobile phone by the age of seven and nine in 10 children have their own device by the age of 11. In many cases, uh, these devices are primarily used for entertainment uh, purposes. So not always for education. So for example, it could be streaming cartoons, movies, or for access to social media. And what this means is that educational content very often has to compete for screen time with other types of digital input. But even if we just focus on educational um, content and the educational category, um, the choice is just vast. Uh, during the first quarter of this year, both app stores reported close to 500 million downloads of educational apps. And that indicates quite a clear um, demand for ed tech tools. The amount of time children spend in front of the device has increased even further because of the pandemic, of course. Um, so the question is, how do we cut through this digital noise and focus on what's really meaningful and what truly adds value to the learning process? And of course, as educators, how to ensure that the screen time that young learners and teenagers get delivers quality learning rather than just a passive intake of never ending content. OK, so before we actually answer these questions, I'd like to add another layer on top of that. And that layer is parent expectations. Parents, of course, play a very important role in how digital learning is realized. And it's not just digital learning, but learning in general, of course. A recent study by our language research team at Cambridge asked a group of parents what they would like educational technology to do for their children. And that is if remote learning were here to stay. 
So there were four key expectations that emerged from this research. Parents wanted digital tools to provide a level of interactivity. They expect content to be motivating, fun and engaging. On top of that, they want tools and materials to offer an opportunity for both direct contact with the teacher and some elements of social interaction. So, for example, with other class members. So, given these expectations and the overwhelming amount of digital input that children are exposed to, how can educators assess the educational value of digital tools and really what does good look like? So for us, the answers lie in digital pedagogy and research. And in order to add value to learning, digital tools and materials need to do three things. So they need to facilitate cognition, they need to spark engagement, and finally, they need to encourage positive learning behaviours. Our language research team at Cambridge developed a set of language learning principles around these three key areas and they also applied them to digital to create some useful insights so we're going to look at some of these insights in more detail now and i'm going to share with you some examples of what they mean in practice for both primary and secondary learners while looking at these three areas of cognition, engagement and learning behaviours. I'm going to use some examples from our new digital learning environment, Cambridge One, which you can see on the right, and also two of our latest courses for schools. So Cambridge Primary Path for young learners and Own It for teenage learners. OK, so let's start with cognition. And the first insight here identified by our lovely research team is that learning happens via our working memory, which has very limited capacity. Learning is inhibited when we overwhelm the learner's working memory and we are unable to process new information. And there are a few things that digital tools can do to prevent cognitive over overload, um, because this is what we're talking about here. So let's have a look at an example. This activity here comes from the Cambridge Primary Path Practice Extra experience. As you can see, the activity is chunked into small bits and bites, um, which allow the learner to focus on the task. There is a very clear indication of completion at the top of the screen uh, to give the learner an idea of where they are in the activity and also how much there is to complete. Students are supported with clear and simple instructions. You'll also notice that distractions are minimized and there are no redundant elements on the screen that could otherwise divert learners' attention away from learning. Finally, the activities can be viewed on a screen of any size, so mobile, tablet, desktop, and there is instant automated feedback after each item. So based on the result, when the learner gets to the end of the activity, um, they can decide to, for example, review or repeat the activity. The second insight from cognition has to do with consolidation of knowledge. Learning requires consolidating knowledge and skills to long-term memory through techniques such as spaced repetition, elaboration, rehearsal, and relating to personal experience. So let's see how this works in practice. So the example here comes from our secondary course, Own It. And in this activity, students watch a vlog 
and to answer questions based on the video. They are then guided through the whole process of planning and creating a vlog. And um, you can see on, the, on this screenshot here that access to content is staged and they start with quite basic questions and then um, they progress through uh, this whole um, activity which helps the learner master the, the main learning points for the unit. Then they make their own vlog uh, where they can relate the content to their personal experience. And in this particular, particular unit, students are encouraged to talk about things they love, don't mind and hate doing. So by relating the new language and uh, grammar structures to uh, something around their own personal life, they actually consolidate it into the long term memory. And also while creating their vlog, the learner has the chance to use techniques such as elaboration and rehearsal, which are both uh, beneficial when it comes to retaining knowledge. So again, great for consolidation. So um, we have so far seen two examples of digital materials that help with cognition side of learning. I'd like to now introduce the first teaching tip that hopefully will help you make the most of digital tools. And so it goes like this, unlike print materials in which learners may have already written their answers, digital practice tasks allow learners to repeat the task. So encourage the, um, uh, the learners to revisit tasks to help consolidate their learning. And providing the ability to repeat activities is something that digital does really well. And um, some teacher tools even allow you to see how many times a student has attempted a task along with uh, the score for their first and last attempt. And this can actually be a very useful piece of information that can tell you how quickly they are learning and how well they've consolidated the learning into their long-term memory. Okay, so let's move on to the second area of uh, language learning. And um, so here, the first insight we have um, is about social relatedness. Our willingness to engage in learning is strongly affected by social relations within the group. Learners need to feel comfortable interacting with others, trying out new language, giving and receiving peer feedback. So the example I'd like to use here to illustrate how digital can facilitate social interaction and engagement in general is a tool called Collaboration Plus, which is part of the ONET digital pack for secondary learners. It enables teachers and students to collaborate on projects and to share work with the class. And students get to work together in small groups towards a common goal. And that goal could be, for example, creating a website for a festival or naming a street food van. Each project is split into stages um, and that's done to equip students with everything they need to deliver the final outcome. So let's have a look at how it works. And I'm just going to do a really quick demo for you here. So um, each unit has a project, as you can see, and each project is divided into these different stages and steps. Um, and within each stage, learners can communicate, so they can post information, they do their task together in a small group. Um, and each member of the group can actually post um, a message to the rest of the group. Um, and they go through each step. Uh, these steps may include things like gathering relevant information for the project, agreeing direction, maybe assigning roles within the project, uh, working on the content, 
uh, and then presenting the outcome, which could take on any form. It could be an audio file, could be a PowerPoint presentation, it could be a video. So um, in here, what we're saying is that students are going through these different steps of the project. And at the end, um, they give the project a title, they write a short summary for the project, uh, they can then uh, provide a link to any file. So for example, a PowerPoint presentation or a video, and then they submit the project to the teacher. The teacher can then provide feedback and assessment for both the group as a whole and individual group members as well. So that's really great that we have this two types of feedback. It's not just for the group, but it's also for individual students. And then the teacher has an option to also uh, make the project uh, visible to the rest of the class through um, something that we call show, uh, showcase, which you can see here. So that's collaboration plus for you. And this type of collaborative learning helps develop better critical thinking skills because learners have to explain their reasoning uh, to the rest of a group, for example, or they need to think through an argument to understand the problem. It also helps them develop um, confidence and motivation to work independently, but also as part of of a team. Um, so um, they, they know they, they have to do their bit and they are accountable to the rest of the team as well. Okay, so the next insight from engagement is about enjoyment. We are more motivated to engage in learning tasks which we enjoy. And this seems quite uh, natural, I think. Um, this also means that materials that um, we use should not only be fun, but also motivate us to want to do more. And to illustrate this, um, I'd like to show you an example of a game for young learners. And it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's called Fish Grow. And it's one of the games on the uh, Cambridge One uh, learning environment. Um, which offers age appropriate and playful content that puts the learner in control. So the idea here is simple. And again, I'm going to give you a short demo of this game. It's actually me playing it. Um, the idea is simple. So you manipulate the, the movements of a fish to swim into bubbles uh, with correctly spelled words, and you want to avoid bubbles with words that are misspelled. And this is a great example of spaced repetition in action, uh, where students encounter the language they may already know, but they see it in a different context. And that helps them remember it better. Learners have an objective to collect points, but they're also engaged in active learning that allows them to revise and recycle language. So it's not just about sw swiping to uh, move the fish up and down. Um, they're actually engaged with their minds on um, in, in this um, active learning. And these types of educational games offer a great balance between skill and enjoyment. Um, and that's really important when we talk about gamification. Okay, so here is a teaching tip number two uh, that can hopefully uh, help you maximize engagement uh, when teaching with digital materials. As well as using automated feedback embedded within digital materials, make time in your lessons to deliver personalized human feedback, either face to face or in digital written or audio files. And automated feedback is great because it's instant, but it does need to be reinforced by other types of feedback. So in different formats, so that we can maximize that impact. Okay, so the last area of learning I'd like to look at today 
our behaviors. And I have a few examples of how we can foster positive learning behaviors using digital tools and materials. So the first insight in this area is around goals. Goals focus attention, prompt action, and reduce the task of language learning into manageable steps. So how does this work in practice? The example here shows a learning path of Practice Extra, uh, which allows the learner to basically orient themselves around the learning journey and also to reflect on how far they've come. They can also get a quick overview of their achievement over time. In this case, uh, represented by gold and bronze medals, which students can collect as they progress through their learning. They can, of course, set themselves a personal goal, uh, for example, of getting to a gold medal, uh, which would require them to repeat activities and get better and better each time. The, this path, a learning path, is aligned to the student's book. And this means that learners can e explore extra content in a scaffolded way towards their learning goals. Another example of fostering positive learning behaviors can be found at the end of an activity when the learner is presented with the result. So in this case, the learner scored two out of five points. So there is clearly room for improvement. Um, they get a motivational message, great start. And they're also encouraged to try again. So in addition to written feedback, there is also an element of gamification in the form of medals, uh, which provide a bit of extrinsic motivation but also visual feedback. Finally, we have this friendly monster giving the learner a thumbs up. And we know from research that presence of a social partner uh, promotes learning, especially at a young age. Children often perceive, perceive themselves to be interacting with these on-screen characters um, although, of course, these characters quite often can't really respond, um, but um, it, it provides an element of social interaction, which we know is so important when learning. Okay, and the final insight for fostering positive learning behaviors is around strategies. Learners benefit from using strategies to organize and support their learning effectively. So this can, for example, take on a form of a learner dashboard, which shows an overview of progress and achievement. Seeing all the information nicely structured and organized in one place helps with goal setting and self-reflection. For both parents and teachers, it's a great source of information about the learner's strengths and weaknesses. And so if, if you have access to metrics such as, for example, first score, best score, and the number of attempts for each activity, that can give you um, great information about um, how fast the learner acquires and assimilates new material, but also about their level of engagement. So if we, for example, see a student who has repeated the same activity multiple times and they got better and better each time, that's a great sign of a very engaged uh, student who's, who's really doing well in terms of um, uh, learning. The final example I wanted to share in relation to um, support strategies are brain breaks. And this is a feature of the Cambridge Primary Path course on Cambridge One, um, where students are encouraged to relax, take a break, and practice some simple mindfulness. Like, for example, recognizing that they may be tired, and they might want to move around a little bit, or maybe 
they might want to listen to some calming music or sounds. Um, and this is great because it promotes responsible use of screen time and also fosters well-being. And on top of that, it can be used um, as a strategy in terms of managing energy levels in the classroom or in a Zoom call. And the final teaching tip that I wanted to share with you is about reflection. Reflection is an important learning strategy, regardless of the learner's age. So the tip is encourage learners to engage in reflection at the end of an online task, for example, in a form of questions about what they found easy or challenging and how they felt the digital format impacted on their experience of completing the task. The approach to this can be adapted to the age and skill level of learners. So for example, for younger, younger children, it might be more effective to do this in a, a basic, as a basic activity. For example, using emoji uh, where a smiley face means it worked well, we love it, and a sad face means it didn't quite work for us. For lower level students, it's absolutely fine to do this in L1 um, and to get the, the full benefit of this activity really because it's about finding out what students think um, about a, a specific digital uh, tool or material. Um, so, um, we've now covered all three areas where digital learning can add value. And as a final remark, I wanted to encourage all of you to try and find the right digital learning blend that works for you and for your students. Digital learning isn't about replacing physical learning or replacing books. Uh, the pandemic has forced us in a way to move a lot of our interactions online, but it's unrealistic to expect that young learners or even teenagers will spend seven hours a day glued to a screen. So let's focus on what digital does well and incorporate multimodal experiences that use all types of learning from kinesthetic and auditory to visual and reading or writing. Finally, as we've seen uh, with the last example of brain breaks, fostering digital wellness um, seems especially relevant and important in the current times. So let's try and help students find the right balance between digital and physical worlds. Okay, so um, if you found the content of this presentation useful, you may also want to download our checklist for teaching uh, with technology. So the three teaching tips that I shared today um, are part of the checklist. We also have more, so you can use the checklist to kind of sense check whether you're doing a lot of these things, but also maybe to get some inspiration for what you could be doing in the future. The checklist is free and we will post uh, the, the link to the checklist in the chat box. So I think our moderators are actually doing it right now. So uh, check the chat box. And thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this session useful and that you'll be able to start incorporating some of these digital insights and ideas into your teaching. Um, so I think it's back over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Kasia. Thanks, everybody. Um, lots of questions coming in. Um, one of the things I think would be useful, Kasia, and um, we're getting a lot of questions just about Cambridge One itself, and I think a lot of people are very new to it and they don't know it at all. Um, so could you perhaps just give us a very brief overview of what, what Cambridge One is, how you might access it, and where you can find further information? That would be really helpful. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Charlotte. I'm, I'm glad that there is so much interest around Cambridge One. So Cambridge One is our new digital learning environment, 
where um, we call it our new home for digital learning, really, because the idea is that all materials are there in one place, right? So no matter you know what uh, Cambridge course you're um, you're using, you you would have everything in one place. So both your students and your teachers. So that's the idea. It's new, and we are adding more and more courses to uh, to uh, Cambridge One. Um, what's also great about it is that and this is really relevant to uh, the primary and secondary uh, uh, context. Is that it's age appropriate. So what this means is that it offers a content and, in general, experiences that are tailored to different age groups. So um, some examples I showed you included the um, the activities where you see this little friendly monster. So that's for primary um, learners, and we have lots of collaboration opportunities for. Uh, teenage learners as well. So um, this age appropriate um, element is quite important, I think. And finally, um, another great thing about Cambridge One is that um, it offers you um, data that you can trust. So looking at metrics that some of which we've seen today, um, things like um, first attempt, you know, last attempt, uh, different uh, scores. And so a nice overview for the teacher, the parent, and uh, also for, for the learner. On top of that, um, the learners have elements of gamification. So we've seen some of these um, medals here. So it's a really nice way of rewarding uh, positive learning behaviors. And um, so, yeah, finally, how, how to get to Cambridge One. Um, you can um, have a look at it if you um, type cambridge.org slash one. Uh, so that's cambridge.org slash one. And it will take you to the home page where you can um, log in and uh, start exploring the experience. Great, thanks, Kasia. Um, I think we've been posting links in the chat throughout, so you'll be able to to find those easily and find out more information on our website. So please do go and have a look. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more questions for you, Kasia. Um, I've got a nice question here about using polls, as in P-O-L-L-S, <laughs> um, with students for collecting opinions as a different kind of project work. What's what's your opinion on that as a, a way of engaging students? I, th I think polls are fantastic. Um, I used to use polls a lot to, as a teacher. I use them now as well in workshops. Um, I think it's, it's a great way of engaging um, your audience, um, especially online in the current circumstances where you know, it might be quite challenging to involve everyone at the same uh, time. Uh, so gathering that input through poll and then displaying it on the screen and sharing your screen um, is definitely a great way of engaging learners and uh, a way of uh, providing that interaction, a level of interaction. Um, so polls can be used in many different ways. Um, you can use them as an opener, you know, uh, to gather people's um, opinions, or you can actually use them as well as a support strategy. So we talked about uh, reflection, which is really important. Uh, so um, yeah, you might want to use a poll just to gauge um, how well an activity went or what uh, students think about a specific uh, digital um, activity tool or content. Great, okay. Um, we've got another question here from Emir, um, basically asking her about what, what you would recommend, what digital tools um, you would recommend to help students prepare for examinations. So we've got a specific example of KET, PET and C1, but I would say for, for any exam preparation, Kasia, what, what you would recommend? Um, so I, there are a lot of great tools out there and um, from both from Cambridge and from, from um, Others as well, we're developing some more uh, tools actually on Cambridge One that will help you uh, with exam preparation. And I think um, what one thing that I would actually um, mention when 
choosing um, a good digital tool is to reflect on what you would like it to achieve, right? So um, thinking about um, the digital pedagogy part of it. And, and um, there are a lot of tools that look attractive, um, but maybe they don't really deliver on the um, pedagogy value of things. So, uh, so think about these three language areas that we discussed uh, today. So um, cognition, engagement, and learning behaviors, um, and then uh, choose the tool that works for you and your students. Um, yeah, so I think that that would be my top advice, uh, rather than uh, saying, you know, which uh, specific tools um, I would recommend because you may have a slightly different context or um, situation or um, so, so yeah, uh, do your research, then apply the criteria that we talked about today and find a tool that works for you. Brilliant. Okay. Um, we've got um, a couple of questions around sort of collaborative tasks and just, you know, that I think really around the sort of social interaction um, that you can foster in digital learning, especially at secondary level. Um, and so the question is really just asking for some more information about um, what you showed, Kasia, around the collaborative tasks. Um, I don't know if you can share any more insight into that at all. Absolutely. Um... So Collaboration Plus is actually a new tool and we're all very excited about it. So um, yeah, it, it kind of gives you this staged um, uh, and supported process of going through um, a project. And I think what's really great about it is that, you know, sometimes these projects might feel a bit daunting. Um, because yeah, if you just think about what you need to provide as an outcome, but if you actually get that support uh, throughout the whole project and uh, you get to focus on just a small task at a time and over time it kind of um, gives the, the learners um, confidence and, um, uh, and strategies that they need to actually get to the final uh, outcome. And, Result. So um, we have uh, prepared a, a video and uh, that shows um, this uh, specific experience, but also in the context of the whole digital pack for all it uh, for the secondary uh, course. And I believe that we might be able to uh, post a link to it in in the chat box as well. So have a look uh, and yeah. I'm sure yeah, you'll be able to, um, uh, to see the benefits of this type of uh, learning, collaborative learning, which I think is really relevant in the current uh, circumstances where many of us are still home-based and can't really get that physical interaction yet. Brilliant. Okay. I think we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. Keep your questions coming, by the way. Um, keep, keep putting them in the Q&A box. Um, so I have a question here um, from Leila. She's basically asking about um, free resources, really, that, that perhaps Cambridge makes available. So um, things, I guess, that we offer on our website or our blog. Um, is there anything you can suggest that she can use and adapt, Kasha, for her students? She doesn't Absolutely. say what level her students are, so I'm not sure if they're primary or secondary. Yeah, um, we, we do have uh, resources for, for every uh, level. And I think you mentioned uh, some of them already, Charlotte. So um, things like resources, free resources that are, can be downloaded from, uh, from Cambridge.org. We have our World of Better Learning blog as well, where we regularly post uh, articles related to uh, primary and secondary um, teaching and with some tips and tools um, and teacher experiences as well. Uh, we have the Learn, Learn English with Cambridge um, YouTube channel, uh, which can be used by teachers as, um, you know, multimedia uh, content uh, for the classroom. Uh, and we have the Cambridge Dictionary as well, which um, provides lots of free uh, content as well. So things like uh, word lists, for example, that you can um, align to whatever course you're teaching. So you can create a, a little word list based on the vocabulary 
in a specific unit or if you're uh, preparing your students for an exam, you can also easily create a word list and, and, um, uh, and uh, give it to them as, um, as a resource. Um, plus, each word list can be actually turned into a quiz. So, um, so yeah, just to add an extra fun um, uh, on top of you know that preparation, whether it's exam preparation or just uh, um, consolidation, um, I think it's it's really nice to um, to do it as in the form of a quiz. You can also you know. Um, maybe challenge your students to um, maybe divide them into teams and um, and give each a quiz or for example so, so it there are many different uh, resources um, that can be used that are freely available on our channels we have social channels as well so facebook twitter instagram youtube with plenty of free and uh, material available to all of you Brilliant. OK, um, time for just one last question. Um, and I think um, we've had a couple of people just asking about IGCSE and ASNA level. I think, Kasha, they probably need to go to Cambridge Education. So um, because we're obviously the ELT side of things. So um, I, I guess we can perhaps post in the, um, the chat the link to Cambridge Education for digital resources for IGCSE ASNA level. Um, but a couple of people have been asking about that. So yeah, okay, so we'll try and put something in the in the chat for you. Um, that probably brings us to an end for, of our session. So um, I would just like to say thank you very, very much, Kasia, for a really interesting session. And you're getting an awful lot of positive comments in the chat. 